everyone. Welcome back to the Healthy, Wealthy, and Smart Podcast YouTube channel. I am your host, Dr. Karen Litzy, owner of Karen Litzy Physical Therapy, located in New York City. And before we go on, make sure you hit the subscribe button so you don't miss a new episode. Hit the like button and the notification buttons to make sure that you know when a new episode is dropping. And today, on today's episode, we talk about a whole whole wide range of things. So we talk, we're talking about travel physical therapy. We are talking about ergonomics and the important role they play in society and for physical therapists in particular. And we talk about being a physical therapist on a Native American reservation in Colorado. And so to help us talk about all these different topics, I'm happy to have on the program Ergonaut, Dr. Steven Stockhausen. He's board certified orthopedic clinical specialist. Initially working in education, he soon transitioned to physical therapy, achieving his doctor of physical therapy from the University of Kentucky. As a therapist, he has extensive experience in orthopedics as well as home care. Aside from helping patients, he has held a variety of leadership positions and serves as an advocate for small businesses as well as clinical and professional excellence amongst his peers. He launched ptadventures.com in 2016 with his wife, where they help guide fellow PTs through the ins and outs of the travel physical therapy industry. Currently, he is a full-time clinician and also serves as the COO of Ergonauts Performance Technology, a technology-based startup specializing in making ergonomics easy and easy and accessible for everyone. So we've got links to everything in the notes below. So if you want to find more, uh, find out more about Ergonauts, you can click on the link below for the website. And if you're a physical therapist, Stephen has a special offer for you from Ergonauts Performance Technology. So if you're a physical therapist or if you're interested in performing ergonomic evaluations, you gotta listen to the end and we will tell you exactly how to get this amazing deal from Ergonauts Performing Technology. So everyone, thanks for tuning in and enjoy today's episode. Hey, Steve, welcome to the podcast. I'm excited to have you on. We have a lot to talk about today, so thank you for coming on. Thanks for having me. So, you know, you've got this really eclectic background as a physical therapist. Is that safe to say? Oh, for sure. Yeah. For sure. So let's start with your previous uh, your previous life, physical therapy life as a travel physical therapist. So I know you and your wife were mm -hmm. both traveling um, and I believe you even had a baby so and that's right. two dogs. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So Talk a little bit about what that life was like as a travel physical therapist and maybe any advice you might have for some younger therapists thinking of doing that. For sure. Yeah. So pretty much we both started our careers in the outpatient ortho, just like everybody else. And we, we wanted to get a good amount of experience um, and you know, work in clinics where we could have some mentorship and, and grow our skills right off the bat. And I think that's super important, especially for anyone wanting to jump into travel. Um, getting a good foundation where you have someone to bounce ideas off of is unbelievably helpful. And so at about two, two and a half years in, we both had already communicated to our clinics that we wanted to, to experience travel and, you know, to pay off a little bit of our student loans. I mean, two of us both together, I think, you know, this is a, over a decade ago now, but, you know, it was a lot. I mean, we're talking like 300 grand in debt when we first got together, I think 240 after we got married by then between the two of us, which nowadays I've heard individuals are, are carrying that. Right. Um, so yeah, we decided to jump into travel knowing nothing at all about it. <clears throat> Excuse me. And yes, yeah, so we took our very first jobs um, in California doing home health. And we spent the next, we were supposed to do two years traveling. We spent the next seven and a half um, out there traveling and just loved it. Um, jumping from place to place. And, you know, I, I think I think it's a wonderful opportunity for anyone, any clinician who wants to kind of get out of the student loan thing, wants to experience the whole country, especially if you don't have anything holding you down. Um, and then what I thought was the, the biggest benefit is you're seeing a different way to approach, you know, patients, a different way to approach EHRs, a different way, you know, mm -hmm. every place that you go, you can learn something new, you can learn from your colleagues and, um, you know, I couldn't imagine of ha having as well-rounded of a, of a background um, being in one place the whole time, because anytime I wanted to get a new experience, I'd have to, you know, pay to go to a course or, right. or whatever it is. Um, 
you know, but to get back to your original question, the number one most important thing for anyone wanting to get into travel is to build a relationship with multiple recruiter companies. So everybody out there says, you got to go with our recruiter. We have the best, we have the best job. It honestly, they all are about the same. I mean, if you want to kind of a, a behind the oh, scenes. Oh no, the cat's out of the yeah. bag. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they all basically are picking from about 80% of all their jobs are the exact same as everybody else's, mm -hmm. but each company has maybe 20% different than other people. So it really does um, make sense to have multiple recruiters and then you can build a relationship. So for my wife and I, we worked with two primarily, and then we always had a third, you know, that we built, again, we built this strong relationship with, and, mm -hmm. you know, we haven't traveled now in, we're going into our fourth year. And, you know, our, both of our former recruiters are planning trips to come out and come visit us. I mean, like we're, we're buddies. We visit one of them at, at a convention every year in Vegas. You know, we're friends now because we built that relationship and we got right. amazing jobs because of it. So that well, I think is the best. Well, I mean, and that's with any job, especially in healthcare, especially in physical therapy, it's relationships, 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 right? You're yeah. not going to get far in this world if you are not good at building relationships and partnerships mm -hmm. and making them so that they're lasting. Like you said, you haven't, you've been out sure. of the game for four years and the relationship still exists. Mm -hmm. So it's not just like this flash in the pan relationship and then you're out of it and it's over. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And then through that relationship, you understand like, how can we make this mutually beneficial? Um, a lot of travelers I, and a lot of my good friends who still travel, it's very confrontational. You know, they want, tell me, you know, what's your, what's your rate? What are you making? What's your profit margin? They want to know every little detail. And then if the pro they arbitrarily think the profit margin is too high, then they, they think the recruiters trying to, trying to kind of hose them or something. And that's not always the case. You know, there could be internal policy and there could be other things. Mm -hmm. involved. So it doesn't have to be that way. You can both work together and both, you know, be successful and, and do really well financially if that's your goal, you know? Right. And now, so <clears throat> let's talk about, give me like maybe three or four pros, three or four cons, if they exist of travel PT. Okay. Um, I mean, definitely the, the money is, is a huge one in, in, in travel for sure. Um, being able to see new places and it's not just being able to see new places like you would on vacation. A lot of people write off, Oh, I'm good where I live. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. You get like the insider, you, you know, the local dive bar, you know, the great little cafe that's off the corner. You, you learn all that because you've been there three, six, nine, sometimes 12 months. If you choose, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that's, I think that's huge. And then the ability, especially in, in this kind of post COVID days of kind of fighting burnout by you can schedule as much time off as you want. Yeah, you're not going to get paid, but you're getting paid so much better. It makes it mm -hmm. you kind of do whatever you want. There's so much flexibility, um, and you can change locations and setting, you know, as your resume allows. Pretty much, you know. So once you kind of build experience in one particular setting, mm -hmm. um, it's really easy to bounce around and say, hey, you know, I'm tired of this outpatient thing, or I'm tired of the acute care. I want to go into home health, or I'm tired of doing that. I want to do a something really more relaxed or whatever, you know, you have that opportunity. Yes. Yeah, so you've got options. So yeah. what about, what are the cons? You know, I think, I think for us, we did have a kid on, on, on the road. Um, and it was in between contracts and, you know, the challenge for us became school. How are we going to mm -hmm. navigate that? Um, and moving very frequently became, it's just, the hassle factor, maybe we're getting old, I don't know, but <laughs> you know, moving more frequently than, than every six months became something we just didn't, didn't really want to do. And then yeah. I think the, the clincher for us to kind of settle back down and maybe it was the timing because it was like, right as COVID had, had sort of hit um, was community. You know, we, we had gone into an area where we had probably three or four different travel couples that were living in the in the Bay area, you know, it's a mm -hmm. huge travel community there. Um, and they all happened to have contracts end and they moved to other spots. And then here we are, you know, COVID hits and it's just the two of us and a baby. And we're mm -hmm. like, you know, we, we missed our friends back home here permanently in, yeah. in Colorado. So I think those would be the two 
I would, I think really it's only those two things that I yeah. would say would be a downside. It is, you know, just like anything, it's what you make of it. You know, there's going to be ups and downs, mm-hmm. there's gonna be struggles. Um, you know, we decided to get a lot of home health experience because a, it pays unbelievably. And the lifestyle is just amazing when you're on the road. Um, and you really can see the community you're in because you're, you're traveling from patient to patient. I know um, it. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, anyways, I think, you know, I think that's a, a, a big benefit, um, to kind of jump around that way. Great. And now, like you said, you settled down and now you are in Colorado mm-hmm. and you are working with our indigenous population in Colorado, which I find fascinating. And I said before we went on the air, I'm a little embarrassed to say that I don't know a lot about the the current state of indigenous communities outside of watching Reservation mm. Dogs, which is, I mean, listen, everyone, if you've not seen Reservation Dogs, like run, don't walk. It's on Hulu, watch it. And I think it's on FX. I think those are the two stations. It's a big plug for Reservation Dogs, but um, it's a great, great show. Um, but that's the, really the extent of my knowledge and my knowledge of healthcare because they they're in the show. They actually have a healthcare clinic and they kind of show some of the inner workings of that. But can you give the listeners a little bit more information on what it's like working with this population and and how your position as a physical therapist works within that? Uh, within a reservation or within the indigenous population, because there may be people out there who are like, you know, I think I want to do that. Yeah. So our, our situation is a little bit unique. Um, most reservations, it's my understanding, are still under the sort of the IHS system, um, which would be a, a federal job. Our particular tribe has chosen, and they have every tribe, from what I understand, has this opportunity to kind of take over their own health care um, as long as they continue to make it available to other tribal, um, you know, other indigenous people. So mm-hmm. our, our particular tribe is the, the Southern Ute Indian tribe. Um, I work for the Southern Ute Indian Health Center, but we are eligible to see anyone who has um, IHS benefits, anyone who has any, um, any tribal bloodline at all. So mm-hmm. we, see, we see everybody. Um, it's, a, it's a pretty well- um, like encapsulated unit. So it's, we're a clinic, we're primarily, you know, primary care. We have one pediatrician, um, you know, and then we have some visiting specialists that kind of pop in and out. But the neat thing is I'm, you know, I'm right there next to, you know, the primary care doctors and we, we bounce ideas off each other all the time. They'll pull me in to see something that, you know, maybe they're not comfortable with and, you know, I'll pull them in as well. Um, and it's, I, I kind of feel like it's sort of how, in PT school, school, they told us we we're going to be kind of practicing, you know, shoulder to shoulder with these doctors, mm-hmm. you know, you get out and it's, you never see a doctor and you maybe get them on the phone, maybe. Um, right. And, you know, this is great. You know, if I have time at lunch, I work through lunch most of the time, but if I have time at lunch, you know, I go and walks with these guys and we can just kind of become friends and, and, and really work together. And I think it's super beneficial for these patients because they don't, um, you know, you only get so much time with the patient. Each of us only get so much time. Mm -hmm. I'm seeing something that they're unaware of. You know, we, you know, having that proximity, things come up in casual conversation that maybe you you wouldn't necessarily um, identify or or draw out. So um, yeah, so in my particular situation, I'm seeing patients once an hour uh, with this particular community. um, And I've understand that this is with other, you know, tribes as well. I I can't really speak for any others, given that this is my only experience, but culturally it just helps to have that amount of time. Mm -hmm. Um, Sure. There's patients that I could, you know, I see patients in 15 minutes sometimes, and that's, you know, they're the real go-getter type. They don't want to talk. They just boom, boom, boom. And you're in and out, you know? Um, And then others, we, we don't do a ton, you know, we are 45, 50 minutes, you know, maybe a box of tissues, just kind of talking about, either life or trauma that kind of led into this injury or, you know, whatever happens to be going on for them. So it's a, um, it, it challenges sort of what they, you know, they call the soft skills. It challenges that more than I anticipated coming into the setting. I thought it'd be more like traditional, you know, outpatient orthopedics Mm -hmm. with maybe a group that is way more predisposed to diabetes and other, you know, other health issues like that. 
and you definitely get that but there's um there's a cultural side there's a lot more trust that needs to be built um you know and and there have been unfortunately years of distrust of the health system that our team is really consciously working towards undoing so yeah and was any of that surprising to you uh as you started you know being in your position longer and longer was was that surprising to you that wow i'm 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 really surprised that hmm. these folks at times just need someone to to speak to and someone to listen to them yeah i i had never experienced this um in the outpatient setting mm -hmm. so in home health um you know there's there's I, I think there's a big we don't we don't understand autonomy as well as we should, I feel like, and the value of every single person having autonomy in some aspect of their life. So in the home setting, you'd go in there and you know all our clinicians, everyone has their you know all their things that we complain about. And you know, at first, I'd be like, man, I didn't get anything done with this lady. She just wanted me to like reprogram her coffee maker and then, help her set up voicemail and then make sure the cat litter is taken care of. And like, I'm here to, I'm here to treat your broken hip or whatever it happens to be. Right. Um, and then over the years of doing this, I kind of realized like, this is her only thing she can take care of and only thing that she has control over. She can't even leave the home. I mean, in, in the home health setting, you are by definition homebound, you know, mm -hmm. uh, they don't have any help. They don't have any family. They don't have any resources. Maybe they're you know, Medicaid, you know, Medi-Cal, whatever you happen to have, um, they, they feel like everything is outside of their control. And so maybe these things that we take as being pushy or bossy, maybe that's just like them trying to grab hold of whatever it is that they can possibly mm. grab hold of. Um, and that changed my, once I made that realization, it totally changed my perspective and I was able to have a lot more patience for that. And I'd only ever seen things like that in the home setting and then here at this particular environment you know you have to respect the storytelling is very slow very convoluted and you cannot interrupt um and culturally it's really uncommon for them to make eye contact oh, so they will be looking 90 degrees away from me and i'm feeling like they don't care and they don't want to be here mm -hmm. but in reality they're actually opening up and it's at the end of the session that you get these, you know, big kind of breakthrough moments. But, you know, for 40 minutes, I'm thinking to myself, like, what are we, what are we <laughs> doing here? Why, if you don't want to be here, why are you, why are you still talking for 40 minutes? And then at the end, you realize, like, oh, it comes oh. all the way around to what's going on. And now we can, now we can work, work. Yeah. Yeah. And I love that you talked about that concept of autonomy for the patient. Cause oftentimes when people hear of, of home health in the setting you were talking about. And I'm sure mm. it's the same in the setting you're in now. People often think of the autonomy of the therapist, mm -hmm. not so much the autonomy of the patient. Don't you think when you hear oh. that word and especially in home health, you think, oh, I have autonomy as a therapist. But um, I, I love that you said that because it's something that I think I know, but never put a word to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there was a, a fascinating study. I don't know if you've heard about this. I, I'm probably going to mess it up. But um, basically, the premise of the study was these groups of individuals went into nursing homes to have conversations with some of the elderly. And when they finished their nice little conversation, they were split into two groups. And they'd say, one group would say, okay, um, what time would you like me to come back next week? And then the other group would say, I'll see you next week. And the difference between allowing the resident, the elderly person to choose the time or just dropping in on them in their overall mortality became so profound, they stopped the study because that little bit of control, I mean, it's, you know, a, a similar mm -hmm. one was done of giving someone a potted plant and asking them to take charge of this for X mm -hmm. amount of time. Those people that have the plants outlive their peers over that same period of time. Right. Just having control and having purpose. And I mean, that 
anyways, so we're getting, we're getting into the weeds we're, a little bit. That's okay. I love it. I love it, but you're right. It's, it's having a control and then deeper having a purpose. For sure. For sure. And just seeing that and understanding that when these patients are being grumpy or bossy or what, maybe it's not grumpy or bossy or just an unruly kind of individual, maybe other things in their life are so out of control that they've identified mm-hmm. this, this is the one thing that I can hold on to and yeah. manage. And I would so. imagine in the population you're working with now, um, it within an indigenous population, traditionally in the United States, they have not been treated very fairly um, no. from a systemic mm-hmm. point of view. And so talk about not having control yeah. over much, right? Mm-hmm. And so yeah. I think it's so it's so great that you can recognize that and that the healthcare practice that you're working with recognizes that and gives people back some control to help with things like longevity and decrease of uh, mortality and um, chronic conditions like heart disease, diabetes, things like that, which is traditionally higher in those populations. Oh, for sure. For sure. Through the roof. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. And I love that you're working with the doctor like that. It's like you're a team. Like you said, like, that's what we all learn, right? Like, oh, don't worry, you'll be part of a team. And then you yeah. get out there and you're like, where's the team? <laughs> what what yeah. happened to my team? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's great. I mean, you know, if I, if I feel like I'm seeing something that needs imaging, I just literally walk next door and say, can we, can we go do this? Can we yeah. get this done? Or, you know, I had a, I had a, a total hip patient just last week who had um, a little spot on her wound that I'm like, you know, let's, let's get this taken care of. And immediately slid her in the schedule next door and the nurses took care of it. And yeah, I mean, it was great. Otherwise it'd be, you know, either a go to the ER, or go back to the surgeon, but I don't know about where you are, but where we are, the surgeons are booked out Jeez, Oh yeah, like weeks and weeks in advance. Yeah. And that's, if you're already on their caseload, I mean, yeah, yeah. Oh yes. Up. So, you know, we can just get it taken care of and turns out it ended up being nothing. And now we know, and everyone's at ease and yeah. Oh, that's great. And what advice do you have for physical therapists or other medical professionals that are listening who might be interested in working with this population? I know your situation's a little different than, than, than a traditional IHS uh, position, but what advice do you have for people even looking to work with this population or even when they're already in it? Yeah, I think kind of, honestly, it's a lot of what we were just discussing, you know, having, having that perspective of um, supporting these individuals without, without pity. And because that's, I think something that can come off as, you know, a lot of us, especially being, you know, a white male, um, helping this particular group of people, it can be very condescending if you have any pity in the way that you're presenting mm-hmm. um, yourself and your services, even if it's as well-meaning as possible, you know? Um, so just supporting them without kind of, because pity, part of pity is like judging someone that they're, you know, not as well off or in as good of a situation right. as they should right. be. And so trying to just eliminate that and just see it as it comes and let them have control and trying to be as understanding as you can about, you know, maybe a bad situation that comes up or an awkward Mm -hmm. situation that comes up. Um, I think just having that open mind and, and not judging negatively, but then also not judging on the, the, Oh, what was, you know, I'm feel so bad for you little native people. You know, that's, it's, so we get donations all the time to our tribe of this, like used, like orthotics and things. And it, it's just like, we don't, we can buy new, right. new power, we can new buy, new buy brand new, you know, power steps or whatever they happen to be like, we can, we're okay. Right. Um, anyways, it just, it comes off as not so great. Right. So right. I, I think going into this setting, these people definitely need help. They're really interesting to work with. The stories are unbelievable. Um, and then, you know, just, yeah, just respecting them. Yeah. Great advice. Thank you for that. Now, um, switching gears, um, like that isn't enough Mm. what you're already doing, but you are also involved in ergonomics and Mm -hmm. a company called Ergonauts. So 
why, what is your interest in ergonomics and what, if you have any data, any, you know, people love their, their facts and figures. Yeah. So when we're talking about ergonomics, why should we care? Oh, I mean, that, that's an easy question. I mean, that's a, that's literally a $20.7 billion a year question that, we are answering well year after year we are not answering i guess is is the answer to that um you know so basically ergonomic related injuries um account for 21.7 billion dollars of expense every year um and that goes from like handling things that's awkward posture and that's like what they call micro trauma or micro adjustments um repeated movements basically um and so those three categories together add up to about $20.7 billion a year in expense. You know, the average workman's comp, according, this is the National Safety Council's number. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know how they calculated it, but the average workman's compensation claim is a $40,000 expense. And Our claim? You know, that's what that is there. I, listen, I, I believe it. I believe less, it, but man, yeah, that's a lot. It seems like a whole lot. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but there's also, there's not just the direct cost, but a lot of people are, think of with an, any sort of injuries, the direct cost. So like, oh, the injury costs this much at this doctor and doing these things, but there's indirect costs that depending on your injury, um, your industry can be three to five times as much. So that's retraining that individual that's lost revenue from the productivity that person would have had hosting mm -hmm. their job. Maybe they have to do, you have to find a whole new person because they're no longer capable of doing that job. So there's other expenses that, you know, that go into it, you mm -hmm. know, a lot of your audience, you know, if they're clinic owners themselves, like would understand, you know, I, I did a, a little bit of a clinic director time as well. There's, I've done a lot of things. I was a <laughs> clinic director back in the day. And our goal was to hold people for at least three years, because the expense of finding a new clinician and ramping them up, you need them there for a certain right. amount of time to kind of offset all of that. Right. Well, if every single workman's compensation injury there could be like there's there's losses there that we don't always think of you know top of mind you know and then on top of that we know properly um addressing ergonomics um immediately knocks out 30 percent of workplace injuries so that's a you know that's a big you know sometimes you just can't help it and accidents an accident but if we right. can dial in and optimize somebody's workstation you know, we eliminate a third right right off the bat. Right. So you're saying we should be proactive instead of reactive. Exactly. Exactly. And this is the problem that most of the ergonomic industry is facing is they don't preemptively ad address these issues. Mm -hmm. There's a claim, there's an injury, you know, heaven forbid there's a, a serious injury. Um, and then they address it post hoc. Um, and so one of the things that interested me in, in getting involved with this organization is basically our, our founders created a tool that just expedites workplace evaluations, you know, unbelievably to be, a, to be really honest. I, I did a few of these back in the day for a really well-known backpack company. Um, mm -hmm. I won't say who, but I did a bunch of them and I mean, they would take me an hour a piece and like at least half an hour, maybe 45 minutes to type it up. And then the report I'd send off was like just data, just measurements of a chair mm -hmm. that's like these sizes and these ranges. And, you know, in hindsight, I have no idea what that HR director did with those, right. reports, if anything. Right. You know, and so essentially what our, our tool does is it just expedites the whole evaluation. And then whenever you say, okay, this person needs a new chair, they need a new keyboard. It says these dimensions, but then also here's the two or three that you can choose from that we've already evaluated. And you oh, know, that's nice. Is, yeah, the whole process is is just taken care of. But and to kind of take, oh, go ahead. Oh, you know, I just wanted to ask a quick question. So you had said keyboard and, but mm -hmm. when we're talking about ergonomics, are you guys only looking at people as they sit at a desk or it, does this also look at people who might be working on an assembly line or have like a more physical job? Because, you know, you've got ergonomics for someone in who's behind a desk all day, which is one thing, but you've got ergonomics for someone who works on an assembly line or someone who works at Walmart or at Home Depot or something like that. Yep. Yep. Exactly. So at, as a startup, I mean, we've only launched, I think now we're at six months since we've actually released the, you know, the tool. 
Um, our initial offering is just office. So it's standing and sitting desks. Mm -hmm. um, it can do the whole thing in about 30, you know, what we're telling people is 30 minutes, but our beta testers were around 15, but we wanted to make our marketing a little bit more, you know, less unbelievable. But um, yeah, so that's, that's the initial offering. We already have in the works general industry. Um, we have one that we're contemplating working on for um, like first responders. Oh, wonderful. Yeah, and there's a, there's a few other other like construction industries, another really big one, and and healthcare also. So like mm -hmm. the surgery, you know, things like that. And so these are sure. all, um, you know, not to get too much into the into the details behind you know the tool that we have. Basically, it all runs off of this uh, sort of this lean engineering perspective. Uh, are you familiar with lean or lean engineering? Nope. Like six sigma. <laughs> so, so it all comes back nope, to not a bit. <laughs> all right. So it all comes lean was uh, kind of um, invented by a bunch of I believe it's a bunch of MIT researchers who were studying Toyota and mm -hmm. how Toyota became so incredibly efficient. Um, and so basically, Toyota in Georgetown, Kentucky, can knock out a car every like fifty six seconds. It just knocks out. Wow. And one of the things that's fascinating as, you know, I, I went to University of Kentucky, so I drove right through Georgetown all the time. You don't see the acres and acres and acres of cars sitting there with the white wrap just waiting like you do when you drive through Detroit or other, other areas where there's a lot of car manufacturers. Toyota only makes what they need when they need it. Mm -hmm. um, when I was trying to get into PT school, I worked at a tiny little clinic in rural Kentucky. And one of our main industries in our area was a plastics manufacturer who made like the door panels for Toyota. And this is, I mean, we're talking 20 years ago at this point, they would come in, I'd see these, these employees and they would say, you know, they have a real stressful day because we thought we were going to make Toyota late. They were being fined. I want to say it was like a hundred thousand dollars a day if they delayed Toyota's manufacturing mm -hmm. because it was boom, when we need it. We have what we need when we need it and no earlier and no later because we don't want to store anything. And if there's a problem, we constantly optimize. If you're on the if you're on the assembly line and there's an issue, let's address it right now. Let's make sure it's not a systemic issue and then let's move forward instead of waiting till that car gets all the way through the assembly line and then coming back in with big rubber mallets, making panels line up and stuff like mm -hmm. that. You know? um, anyway, so that's the background behind the lean process. And so basically it's, a, a system of addressing issues and constantly refining. And so what our founder has done, he's taken that, um, that idea, applied it towards ergonomics in general. And he, mm -hmm. he was a, a professor for university of Kentucky. It's kind of our connection, how we got. Okay. Connected. I was going to ask that, but great covered. Yeah. yeah. It was a, it was a LinkedIn, it was a LinkedIn connection, but we were both from UK, oh, cool. both named Steve and it just kind of worked out. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, so he taught the only lean uh, ergonomic certification available, I think worldwide, was was what he was teaching. And then he just made a way of turning it into basically a, an algorithm that would do the same thing for these different, um, you know, desks in this case. And we're using that same approach for other settings as well. And why PTs? Because, you know, there are other people who do health and wellness programs <clears throat> within businesses who do ergonomics. Yeah. And why, why PT, why should we be involved in this and why aren't we involved in it as much as we should be? Oh man, that, that is a fantastic question. So first off, um, why physical therapists? Because this is addressing everything that we do before we need to actually address it. So how many times have we had the carpal tunnel patient pre-op? How many times have we had the neck neck pain, shoulder pain, you know, whatever, hip, low back, all of these issues based around desks or optimizing these workstations before they become an issue. And, you know, oftentimes we see patients that maybe the ergonomics aren't the primary driver of their symptom, but they're definitely one of them. Mm -hmm. so we can, we can knock that out um, right from the start. And then the second reason why physical therapists is, you know, from a you know, I love being a physical therapist the first off, and I've tried almost everything in our profession. You know, I've done the clinic director thing, the travel thing, and I worked, you know, concierge physical therapy kind of when, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Luna care out yeah. in, started in California. Well, I mean, I worked with them when I was one of, they, they didn't have any outreach. So I was even one of the physician liaisons for them, like way back in the day. 
And that just opened my eyes to like, we have so much potential, so many people we can help if we can start breaking out of this brick and mortar clinic structure. Mm -hmm. um, if we can separate that and then even better, if we can kind of work insurance out of the picture a little bit, I mean, who isn't tired of decreasing reimbursement? I mean, every year we hear about decreasing reimbursements. Right. Um, the great thing about this ergonomics is it's generally not insurance-based. Um, it's often cash-based or sometimes the employer can get a benefit through their insurer to, to cover this expense. Mm -hmm. but you're not personally dealing with the insurance. Right, right. It could be more of like a direct to employer benefit or something like that. Or I've had people use their like flexible spending accounts, things mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. And so there's a, it's pretty lucrative. I mean, the, uh, right now it's between 250 and $400 per evaluation. And that's just the desk-based stuff. You mm -hmm. know? And uh, if you get into industry, general industry or construction, it could possibly be even higher. Right. And so, um, you know, kind of spin back to this Ergo Algo office, this product that we current, this tool we're currently using, you know, $400 for half an hour work ain't bad. Pretty good not going to make it in the clinic. And then you can break up your day. Maybe you do half a day of this once a week, mm -hmm. twice a week. You know, I'm not saying everyone has to do it all the time, but it's just a neat opportunity for clinicians to kind of jump into. Um, or the, the side hustle, you know, that's a huge thing right now is people trying to start their concierge, you know, business. And so mm -hmm. whether you're using it as a primary revenue driver or what we're also seeing, some of these clinics are using it as some of the, our um, our people are using it as a, a way to kind of drive, drive up other business as more traditional right. you know, customers. So you can go to the health fair and, you know, offer this and people find out about your, your tool and you go and do it and then build this great relationship with this potential customer. Well, when they have their knee surgery, guess where they're going to come for you know, right. the next right. three months relationships, 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 right? It's a way to get your foot in the door to start the relationship. Yeah. And it can go both, you know, it can go both ways. It's either mm -hmm. an add on at the end of care or mm -hmm. it can be kind of your foot in the door to right. begin. So right. yeah, there's, there's great opportunities, but your, your question before was why not PTs so far? And, you know, a big part of it is this, there's like an aura around ergonomics. That's kind of intimidating. Mm. Um, you know, there are, there are professional ergonomists that are unbelievable at what they do. Um, but they hold that knowledge very close to the chest, for sure. Um, you know, the occupational health nurses as one of the groups that you know we work with pretty closely as well. They're scared of this stuff also. It's just a little bit daunting because you know you're you're making these recommendations that are going to make someone stay healthy. It feels a little bit intimidating, and obtaining that knowledge, you know, can be also daunting as well. And so. You know, I, I feel like this is a great opportunity for anyone who has interest. It's, you know, low cost and it's a great way to get your foot in the door. And um, I think it's a really good opportunity. You know, if I was still running the clinic that I was before, we mm -hmm. definitely, but, you know, and in fact, you know, my, my, my wife is starting a, her own concierge thing here. And mm -hmm. that's one of the things she's going to offer is, is doing that as well. So. And where can people find more information about the tool and about the company, about Ergonauts? Yeah, erg just erg e r g o n a u t s ergonauts.com. You can find out um, about us there. Um, we have a pretty strong LinkedIn presence, um, so there's a lot of information. Just trying to share general information about ergonomics, not just about our company. You know, we post I think like four or five times a day uh, a week. I was gonna say a day. Oh my god, <laughs> that's no, crazy. Never, I would never get any sleep if we were doing that. Um, <laughs> Yeah. And so we're, we're, but we're posting all the time and it's not just all, Hey, come check us out. It, a lot of it is here's some good tips and tricks for just ergonomics and general health um, as well. So, and, you know, one of the things I, I wanted to mention, but, you know, early on is that we want to offer all your listeners, you know, hundred dollars off of the, of the training. And so just type in the code HWS 100 and that's a hundred dollars off. Um, for the, the training. And so the way our program works is it's a training. It takes a couple hours to go through it. It's, mm -hmm. it's how to use the tool. It's ergonomics, just general ergonomics information. Mm -hmm. um, and then what is kind of this lean approach? Like how, how, you know, those are the main three things that are covered. Um, 
and then the, you, you have access to the tool and things right. like that. So. Perfect. Perfect. Well, that sounds great. So again, just to repeat for all of you listeners, if you are interested uh, mm -hmm. in Ergonauts, you can go to ergonauts.com and you can use the code HWS100 for $100 off the training uh, with that coupon code. Sounds like a great opportunity um, for anyone, really. Even if you're at a physical therapist and you're working at an inpatient facility or you're in a hospital, this is Something like you say, you can do on the side if you want to pick up, you know, extra money, you want to pay off your student loans, you want to, you've got rent, you've got a mortgage, kids, why yeah. not? Or one of the things we've seen is um, we've got two pre-physical therapy students who used it. And I've only heard confirmation of one, but the one guy got into physical therapy school using this tool to build just some ancillary experience in the healthcare industry. That's great. Um, so there's that, you know, using it with, you know, your techs, your aides, maybe they're what we normally consider support staff. They don't have to just be support staff anymore. Mm -hmm. They have a real like contributing revenue generating role, um, you know, as, as an option. There's so, there's a lot of flexibility with it, which is what yeah. I think, you know, a positive. And that's purely from the, I know it sounds salesy because I work for the company, but, you know, from the, the physical therapist in me, like, I think this is just such a great opportunity that we need to be here much more present in this mm -hmm. field whether it's through mm -hmm. us or you know there are other tools out there as well but right. physical therapists are really kind of missing this um you know pretty significant opportunity and then oh my gosh people going home for work so you have double the workstations so you have double the risk you know 41 percent you know right. chubb, chubb the biggest insurance company in the world identified 41 percent of people who went home um, during covid developed muscular new musculoskeletal pain 41%. I believe it. Yeah. Yeah. I believe it. I believe it. Yeah. So it's, you have like a chance to kind of double up there with, with okay. your clients and stuff, but, um, this has been great, Steve. Thank you so much. Um, what kind of, what would you want to leave the listeners with from the conversation? What are your highlights? I mean, I, I think our little conversation on, on, respecting the patients and giving them that control and ident understanding that 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 autonomy and that grasping on to whatever it is that they can possibly grasp onto. Mm -hmm. I think that that's something that took me too long to learn and I think would have helped me a lot with my my patients in every single setting um, and yeah. probably in life, you know, yeah. <laughs> really. Yeah. Yeah. You know, then, yeah. Excellent. And then that leads me to my next question, which maybe you answered it, maybe not. But given where you are now in your life and career, what advice would you give to your 20 year old self? Oh, man, 20 years old. Um, you know, I, I think I would have. Um, I would have probably jumped into travel and um, I don't know if I would have changed too much. I think just having that open mind, maybe being a little bit more open minded mm -hmm. early in my career. I, I started right out of PT school. I wanted, I wanted to be OCS, AMP fellow, clinic owner, boom, 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 in that order. And then I got the OCS and I started traveling and was like, oh man, there's a lot, there's a lot more out here. Um, right. You know, I definitely don't, I definitely think that the clinical specialization, I'm a huge fan of. We, my wife and I used to blog about, about travel therapy. Um, and one of our biggest topics and biggest interest from our readers was growing clinical skills while being a traveler. And I, I think very strongly getting some level of extra training, whether mm -hmm. that's a OCS, SCS, you know, NC, whatever those happen to be, but some level of extra training, I think is so valuable. But then after that, I think having an open mind and once you can help patients effectively and efficiently you know, don't be stuck in that one track that you think you, you might follow, you know, yeah. get out there and experience and everything. Great advice. And Steve, where can people find you? If they want to learn more about you, they want to DM you, they want to ask you questions, yeah. where can they find you? So, you know, LinkedIn, I'm on LinkedIn quite a bit, you know, and just type in my name, um, Steven with a PH. Um, and then, you know, I'm on the only social I really do, I guess, is Instagram. Perfect. Um, it's just S stock PT. And then we have a, 
uh, PT Adventures. My wife and I both run uh, ptadventures.com was our blog for travel. Mm-hmm. Um, and we still kind of keep up with it a little bit. We, we are working in that field fairly frequently still. Um, but then we have a, I think it's PT, I'm going to mess it up. PT Adventures underscore is the Instagram for that one. Okay. Perfect. And, and just for all the listeners, we'll have all of those links at the show notes. So wherever you, whatever platform you're listening to this show on the show notes are in that platform and they will have links to everything. Um, So wherever you're listening, the links are there. So Steve, thank you so much for joining us today. It's a great conversation. I appreciate you coming on. Thanks for having me. And everyone, thanks so much for tuning in and listening. Have a great couple of days and stay healthy, wealthy, and smart.